Good afternoon. Welcome to our Good Friday service. This is an unusual service in that it will not end with a benediction. We will leave in silence. If you are led to support our ministry, you'll find the ushers with plates at the doors. We will not pass them today like we normally do. Uh, we thank you, musicians, for being here today. You're already making beautiful noises, and I thank you for that. You'll be called upon to sing, too, so, uh, so hang on. That's coming. Crucifixion was a, a terrible way to die, and the Romans had raised it to something of a high art, and it was different for Jesus than it was uh, for some others, and uh, perhaps we can look at some of that. The scourging that happened before he was crucified, very unusual, that was not normal. But as you're aware, the trials that went on and the demands of the people to, uh, to crucify him, well, Jesus was turned over to folks that um, did this to him. Uh, the uh, crown of thorns, well, there, carrying the cross. He was made to wear a crown of thorns, which is sitting back there uh, behind the altar. And that wasn't normal for crucifixion either. All of these were additional punishments and cruelties that were meted out to this man in particular. Um, A thing that was lacking in Jesus' death was the, the crurifragium, a Latin word for that moment when the guards decided to hasten the death of the one being crucified. The thighs bones would be broken, and that would uh, disenable the crucified to push up to get the last breath of air, and so they would die of suffocation, of course. Um, and that did not happen with Jesus, probably because with the spear that was plunged into his side when they walked around with the mallet, uh, there was no need. He was already dead. And so together this afternoon, we will walk through the seven last words that he spoke from the cross, and uh, we'll have opportunity to sing some, some Good Friday hymns and simply to be together on a day like this. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Lord, Lord, I thank you for the day you've given to us. It has been a beautiful day here, and Lord, we thank you for, for the gift of your Son into our lives in the faith that you have placed there. And so, Lord, watch over us all we say and do here in this place. This is, um, this is a sad event, and we will leave in silence in honoring your Son, Lord. But meanwhile, watch over us in all we say and do. In his name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. A week or so before this day, Jesus said, recorded by Luke, speaking to Zacchaeus, who had come down from that sycamore fig tree, his theme statement, which is, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And even in his last moments, in the extremis of the way he was being treated and dealt with, he had others in his heart, as you'll hear from another speaker or two here. And you know what was going on at the foot of that cross where he was nailed up in that way. They divided up his clothing by casting lots. You know, they, they split up his clothing, but his cloak they couldn't tear in half, and so they, they gambled for it in front of him. Imagine. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him, Luke records. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. Talk about blasphemy, taunting. Oh, he had endured so much up to that point, and now here he is he's seeing these things play out at the foot of that cross in front of him. Boy. And he had it within him to say these words, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Yeah, that is amazing to me. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, of course, in, in the sixth chapter of Matthew, there's that prayer that he gave us. His, his disciples said to him, uh, the, the, the acolytes of, of John the Baptist, he had, he had given them a prayer. Will you give us a prayer? And fundamental in that prayer is our forgiveness of others as we pray for God's forgiveness of us. That forgiveness, that, that concept of making things right before God, that was just him. That was the man Jesus. And it's amazing to me that in the midst of that, he should say to his father, God, you know, forgive these poor souls. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they are killing the anointed one, the chosen one, the son of God. Why? And you know, he says it to us too. Does it resonate in your heart as well? Jesus, speaking of you and of me, says, Father, forgive those poor souls. They really don't know what they're doing. And so you and I start out every day not intending to be sinful people, but, uh, but somehow it, it just happens. Those, those ten pesky commandments get in our way, and we walk afoul of what the Lord would have us be and do. And even so, from the cross, Jesus says to us, Father, forgive them, even those, you, me. A choir especially needs forgiveness. <laughs> we need those words. And you know, the sad thing is, it wasn't just those people back then that put him on the cross. But every time you and I sin, do you hear the sound of a hammer striking a nail into wood through him? because that's the effect of sin across time and across the people of this earth. And so no wonder he pleads to his father, Father, forgive them, even them now here, even me. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do.
I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. We don't know his name. Any details about him, we haven't been really given a lot. All four of the Gospels speak of him. We know he was a sinner just as we are. He wasn't a willing participant in the crucifixion, yet he was meant to be there. There was prophecy that spoke of him being on that cross. And as I I thought about this man, I wished more and more that I would be able to see Jesus the way he did. Up close, that close, to experience Christ's last hours of life. And yes, even his death. As we contemplate the death of the Son of God, I would hope that we could all see Jesus as that man saw Jesus that we could grasp not only what he saw with his eyes, but even more what he heard with his ears. From a point as close to to the cross that Jesus was on as I am to this cross. I want us to see Jesus from the position of the thief on the cross next to him. I want us to see how Christ becomes his hope. This is what takes place with this thief and how nothing else mattered after Jesus spoke to him except for those incredible words that Jesus gave him. Today you will be with me in paradise. Incredible. I want to have us understand and grasp the incredible change that took place in that thief's heart. What happened? And as we do realize the incredible change in us, as we walk as Christians, we too have been united in the death of Jesus. This is what Paul tells us. The Holy Spirit brought something to that man and his heart. That's for sure. For the next words could not be uttered unless the man trusted that he was truly the Messiah. He said before Jesus responded to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That man had been changed. He had a heart that believed. Jesus had become this man's hope. That there was something beyond the pain of his life. Clearly, he was experiencing pain on that cross. But he has experienced pain all through his life. He lived in a world of sin that ended up on that cross. Beyond even that execution that the thief deserved, he lived in a world that has pain and struggle, as do we. Paul told us that this is something we have experienced in our baptism, that we and our sin were crucified with Christ. That should be something that we hold on to. We are united in his death, in our baptism. That's important. We were there with that thief, in essence. And we have been united in his death. We are also united in his resurrection that we will celebrate in a couple of days. And we become new creations through this death and resurrection. He has become our hope, our source of life, our source of salvation, the source of the righteousness which God now create credits to our account. I'm going to suggest to you that as you leave this place in silence to remember that you were there with that thief, that Christ has died for you even as he died for that same thief. Remember that in your baptism, whether a year ago or 89 years ago, you were united with this death on that cruel 
an agonizing cross with the promise that we will be with him in paradise as that thief was promised also. And as you leave, don't look back on your sin, but trust in his life being poured out for you, that you might live and live abundantly. Rejoice in his love, the love that he showed us in his passion, and dwell in his unsurpassable peace with hearts and minds guarded by Christ. Amen.
Yahweh says to his people, you are my witnesses. She was a witness from the beginning of Jesus' life on this earth. The message of the angel Gabriel came to her that she would conceive by the Holy Spirit and bear a child who would be the son of the Most High, God the Father, the promised Messiah, something longing in the hearts of the people of Israel. Eight days later, Anna and Simeon prophesied that after he was born, that a sword would pierce her heart. At age 12, she was in Jerusalem for a festival with her husband, Joseph, and Jesus was not in the returning group. And they returned, and when they found him in the temple, why did you do this to us, Jesus? But he said, I had to be in my father's house. At the beginning of his ministry, his first miracle at Cana was by the invitation of his mother, Mary. She saw the first miracle. She invited it. And she witnessed his public ministry, healing of sick, raising of the dead, and people flocking to him because of the kingdom of God that was manifest in his person. So now she is witnessing something else. She is a witness to his crucifixion. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. To lose a child creates great pain and suffering. It does not seem right that a child precedes the parent in death. Mary is witnessing the public execution of her son. Shame and horror. But there's more going on here. She is present to to witness the once and for all sacrifice for the sins of the world. Jesus is on the cross. He is that sacrifice in his body, the body that she bore. He is the one that she loved, cared for. And now he is on the cross. Only John is there to support her with the other women. There at the foot of the cross. But from the cross, in the midst of his intense agony and suffering, we hear the wondrous and selfless love of Jesus extended to his mother. He honored his mother by turning over care and protection, support and love for her to John, the beloved apostle. He would no longer relate to his son as as son to his mother, but Lord to disciple. In his true humanity, he ensures that her needs are met, and John took her into his home. Jesus, even while dying, exerts control over the new creation that is the result of his passion. He makes all things new. He is the sovereign Lord who transforms relationships, as he did with Mary and John. He grants forgiveness of sins. He makes a new Israel, a new people of God in the church, a people reconciled to God and to one another. We believe on him through the word of the apostles, John recording for us in John 19. They were witnesses of these things, and in our faith we too are witnesses to his love and care, forgiveness and new life. You are my witnesses, says Yahweh.
This morning at the sixth hour of the day, by the time reckoning of Palestine in the first century, that was nine o'clock this morning, 70 of us met out at Beardsley Park this morning to uh, share prayer and scripture and coffee and donuts. Pastor Mark had two. <laughs> and our purpose uh, out there was to wade into scripture a little bit because after all, scripture points directly at the events of this weekend, of, of this day and, and of Sunday. And a pastor began with a reading from Genesis. After all, if you're going to start at the beginning, you start at the beginning, Genesis 3. One of the things we heard was the, the 22nd Psalm, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. And this is David speaking a thousand years before the Christ was born and speaking quite prophetically as, as so much of what David said in Psalm 22 came true on this Friday we call good. And he began with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David, in the midst of the trouble that he lived a lot of his life in, much of it generated by himself, others imposed from the outside. My God, David said, why have you forsaken me? As David was trying to live his life. And, and, and so, you know, when you read David's Psalms, you have to read them in a couple of ways, don't you? You read them for, for what the words meant at the time that he set them down so long ago. And then, as David is speaking, so often we read Jesus' voice giving it to us because the parallels between the two are significant. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus said, from the cross. Now we all in our human relationships and, and, and experiences have been forsaken from time to time in, in much lesser ways than Jesus was feeling at the moment, haven't we? And so sometimes relationships fall apart or, or, or our luck just turns bad, right? There are issues of health that come upon us. And I, I just have heard, too, from members here of, of friends of theirs. Uh, you know, a, a, a one of our members called the office this uh, morning, this afternoon, and said, my mom is within an hour or two of dying. And, and sure enough, and, you know, in moments like that, you wonder, Lord, <laughs> what's your plan here, Lord? It just seems like you've forsaken me because I've been praying for something and it doesn't seem to be coming true for me. And, and Lord, why have you forsaken me? And we have guts to say words like that in comparison to what was going on on this cross. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, noon to three, darkness came over all the land about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Imagine the pain. Imagine the humiliation and the pain and, and the, all that was going on for him. You Christians, you, we, have never had a moment when God had forsaken us even in the worst times that you have experienced, even in those times when you're faced away from God completely, David again in the 23rd Psalm says, uh, the, uh, the personality God himself pursues us even as we're faced away from. You have never, I have never been forsaken by God. He may let us wallow in our own issues, but he promised to be always with us. You heard the waters of baptism a few minutes ago. And, and that, that sacrament is the beginning of the Christ being with you in his Holy Spirit for your whole life no matter what. 
Jesus came to this earth, one of the three persons of God, and, and, and he knew that God would be with him, and he knew that he was living out the direction that God had given him to come down here and to look us in the eye and to lift us up from our brokenness and to seek and to save the lost, as he says to Zacchaeus. And imagine how we must have felt the desperation in his heart for him to say words like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a terrible moment. Uh, it, it just, it makes me wonder. And it makes me so sad again because of my role as a sinful and fallen human being in putting him there. And for him to feel like, like, like the father of us all, the one sent his son to be among us, had forsaken him in those moments. It's amazing. And, and, and there's no answer to this. Some of those standing there heard this and they said, he's calling Elijah. The very last few words of Malachi, that minor prophet, when you get to heaven, don't tell any of the prophets they're minor prophets. They're not going to appreciate that. <laughs> but those last were sentences of his were given him by God that Elijah would come right at the end of all things. And the people listening to this, Old Testament people, said in reaction to, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? That he must be calling Elijah to come and call all things to an end. Boy. And what did they do in a human sense, in a physical sense? They ran and got a sponge of sour wine. We'll talk about that in a minute. And held it up to him as if that would be any kind of help. Think of it. Matthew so wanted us to hear Jesus' voice in the language of the hearth, the first language that Jesus spoke as he was raised in Nazareth, in Aramaic, that Matthew set these words down uh, um, in such a way that as you spoke them in Greek, you were speaking the very words in Aramaic. And they are these, Heli, Heli, Lama Sabakthani.
unless I'm mistaken, you're all human beings. And so was Jesus. He taught us to be human, human enough to acknowledge our need. According to Mark, Jesus had earlier refused to accept the dulling sedative of wine mixed with myrrh during the painful march with the cross piece. But now his body craved something to drink. So he cried, I thirst, dipso. The Lord Jesus is asking for help. Simple human help. I thirst. As the afternoon sun bore down on his neck, as the searing pain of the nails tore into his wrists, as his weight pulled relentlessly against his lungs, and as the weariness crept into his body. His energy was used up, and his mouth grew dry. Some of us, even in the most dire circumstances, don't want to admit that we need help. We might pretend we can do it all by ourselves. Some of us don't want our enemies to have the satisfaction of knowing that we need help. But our Lord Jesus Christ, truly human to the end, which shouldn't surprise us, he took on that humanness for us. And he taught us what it was to be real. He voices his need, I thirst. Consider for a moment what he had gone through. Consider the thirst he had already experienced. Thirsts of a different kind, but thirsts nonetheless. Consider his priorities. He had thirsted just before this for forgiveness. The pastor gave us the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His heart had thirsted and longed for forgiveness for the sin of a straying humanity. Before anything else, forgiveness. That is why he came to this earth. Do you remember how he had thirsted for the woman at the well? She whose life had been so distorted and twisted. She whose marriages were a mess and whose faith was so misplaced. Do you remember how he said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. Do you remember? He thirsted first for for forgiveness for sinners. And now simply, I thirst, are his words. After he has thirsted for forgiveness for the strain, after he has thirsted for redemption for the broken, after he has thirsted for comfort for his companions, after he has thirsted for God the Father, now Jesus can thirst for his own need. Now his humanness is legitimate. The priorities are right. If we hunger and thirst after righteousness first, then we also may be rightly thirsting for ourselves. If we care for others who are hungry, and satisfy others who are thirsty first, then we may rightly thirst for our own needs and not deny them. And we will know his truth. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. These are the words of the one that thirsted on the cross. I thirst, Lord. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. Amen.
Tetelestai. Repeat it after me, please. Tetelestai. One Greek word expresses three words in English. It is finished. In the New Testament, it's amazing that God used Greek in order to communicate the gospel of our Lord. Because Greek is very precise in its tenses. And this word, it is finished, means that the matter has been brought to its termination. Jesus proclaimed this word toward the end of his time hanging between earth and heaven. It's a word that is not just proclaimed that his life was over or that his passion, his suffering was finished and Holy Week was done or that his three-year ministry was complete or even his life. It's a word, first of all, to his father who sent him into the world for a mission. His mission was to rescue the world of humanity from sin, from death, and the power of the evil one, the devil. It's a word that rings out through all of human history and will remain until the end of time into eternity. To tell us die. He came into the world from his kingly throne. He humbled himself being found in human likeness as a real human being. As pastor said earlier, he is the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, who gave his life and his blood to pay for the ransom of the souls of men and women. All who have ever lived, that are living or ever will live, have the debt of their sins paid for, past, present, and even future. Once and for all. Jesus proclaims in this loud cry from the cross that the entire work of the Messiah, the promised one, from Genesis 3.15 to the time when he will come again is complete. It is perfect. Often when we hear that term perfect, we think of a moral character or some kind of characteristic. But the word perfect meaning that he had accomplished his goal. He had reached the end, the promised end that God, through the prophets, predicted. The work of of reconciling God and mankind, making them friends again by the payment for their sins and also by satisfying God's righteous wrath against our rebellion and our sin. All scriptures are fulfilled. The ransom has been paid in full. The debt is cleared. He is the sacrificial Paschal Lamb who takes away the sins of the whole world by his shed blood on the cross. So now in him we are set free. We are set free to be his own, live under him in his kingdom with everlasting blessedness and righteousness, to live a life to his eternal glory because we don't have to do something to get eternal life. He's already done it. It's finished. We know we have eternal life, not because of our performance or our goodness, but because what he has accomplished. And that is what he's proclaiming from the cross. When trials and tribulations of life cause distress or make you wonder if God loves you, remember this word from the cross. And maybe as you approach your own gateway to heaven in this world. Remember this word that Jesus spoke. It is done for you. It is paid in full to tell us thy. It is finished.
To what are you committed? No hands. We'll go on. You have in your lifetimes committed yourselves to a wide variety of things, perhaps to another person, to a task, to a morality, uh, to, a, uh, to a path of education, to, to a job. To what have you committed yourself? The word in Greek is paratithumai, and it has lots of meanings. It's a pretty wide word, really, paratithumai. And it can mean anything from, uh, from a, a, a deliberate showing to, as we speak it at the end of Jesus' life like this, a commitment. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It was now... The hour had come, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus called out with a loud voice. With a loud voice, think of that. Because when he said, dip so I thirst, you can imagine that was not a very loud voice. He started out pretty loud, didn't he? Uh, Mother, here is your son. Son, here is your... Like that. But time has gone on. He's finally worn down. And it's hard for me to imagine that he spoke this so forcefully, uh, but the sentence that Luke sets down here indicates that it it was a bursting out of his last... And he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last, Scripture said. Finally, over. That torture, that time, that opportunity for him to speak lastly to us in the ways that you have heard tonight, all of that is done. And he says, into your hands, Father. Remember earlier he had said, why have you forsaken me? But in those moments, perhaps the Holy Spirit put his hand on the shoulder of this dying man and said, you're not forsaken. We are you, and you are us, and we are together. And it caused him to breathe out his last loudly, as Luke says it. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Is there, is there, can you imagine... Is there a better place to commit your own spirits but to him, into his hands? You know, I, I, I make a mess of things, and some of you do too. Most of you. <laughs> but to commit ourselves to him in such a way as this, in our last dying breath, Lord, take me. My days here are done. I commit myself to you. And you know, in a small way, what if we went from this place and committed ourselves to him, to his work, to service of others, to to a lifetime of prayer, to study of this thing? What What if we, in a small earthly way, would commit ourselves to living a life of which the one on the cross might be proud? We could accomplish a lot in this world if we would take the time just here on this earth to commit ourselves to our Father God in such a way. And at the end of our lives, perhaps, to take the opportunity, spoken loudly, spoken quietly, spoken inwardly, to say one last time, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Amen.